Doncs ja a la conferència anual, i per aquest, per dur a terme això, li passo la paraula a la doctora Patricia Pozo, cap de secció de Neurologia i responsable de la unitat de Cefalea de l'Hospital Universitari Vall d'Hebron i cap també del Laboratori de Recerca en Cefalea d'Oro Neurològic del VIR, que presentarà aquest acte i les preguntes. Gràcies, gràcies. Bé, doncs moltíssimes gràcies a tots per ser avui aquí. Tenim, jo crec, l'honor de tenir quatre ponents, que ara us explicaré una miqueta d'on venen i què han fet. I estic agraïda que el Comitè Científic Intern del VIR i també la direcció de l'hospital hagin escollit aquest tema, que jo crec que es vincula molt amb la recerca que fem aquí al campus. És una recerca que han fet, i ara veureu, molt traslacional i que jo crec que inspira o pot inspirar altres persones no tan sols dintre de la neurologia, però també altres especialitats que fan recerca traslacional per veure que inclús si les coses triguen 30 anys, com veureu ara que us explicaré, es pot arribar a vegades des d'una primera recerca, una primera pista que un té sobre un mecanisme fisiopatològic arribar a un tractament que té un impacte als malalts. Molt bé, doncs avui, com veieu, el títol de la que hem posat és, i ara passaré a l'anglès perquè tenim dos invitats que estan connectats online, però és From Discovery of Mechanisms Involved in Migraine to the Development of Impactful Treatment for Patients. And I was just saying, and I know that professors Edvinson and Goatsby are joining us live from London, actually, and Sweden, they are joining us live today to uh, explain and, and share with us, uh, together with videos that we will have from Professors Moskowitz and Olesen, about what they have done during their lifetime careers and how does uh, that have an impact on uh, patients. So first of all, um, let me share with you that these four um, eminent professors uh, who have worked all of them in the migraine field, uh, have been awarded last year in 2021, the Brain Prize. The Brain Prize is given by the Lundek Foundation and it is the highest ranked prize within the neurology field, um, considered uh, you know, almost a Nobel Prize for, for neurology. And uh, there is a reason uh, why these four uh, professors uh, that come, as you can see, from different parts of the world um, were given and were awarded this prize. So first of all, uh, what is migraine and why uh, was that important? And if you want, why don't we uh, get them to join us live? Si queréis poner, ponerles, o sea, que compartan, su, que les veamos la cara, los dos que sí que se, se conectarán hoy. Why is, and, and they will probably uh, share with us this too, why is migraine uh, something which is meaningful and important to do research on? The first thing is that migraine is not only a headache, it's a constellation of, it's a syndrome, it's a disease, um, mainly perhaps correlated to headache, but which is, uh, which presents itself with attacks that are episodic and recurrent in time that you don't really know when they're going to happen. That creates anxiety and it is a global disease. It affects people around the world during all of your stages in life. You, it's a chronic disease too. And for you to have an idea, more than 4 million people around the globe suffer from more than 15 days of migraine per month, which is uh, extremely burdensome, creates an impact on the individual, their families and society with correlated high costs. And today, as you can see, I'm joined by Professor Goatsby and Professor Edvinson, two of the awardees of this Brain Prize. And with them and together with the videos that the, uh, they have prepared for us, we will travel from uh, the bedside, from the patient, so patients who were suffering and telling us that they were having migraine, to the bench, and uh, you'll realize how these uh, four speakers um, made uh, substantial and important contributions to understand why the head hurts and why migraine is uh, what we know of it as today, and then how they were able to go back to uh, the bedside and develop uh, target-driven specific migraine treatments. So um, let me just, before you say anything, uh, Peter and Lars, uh, I will just, for you to have an idea with whom are we talking, just present their accreditations a bit. 
I'll start with Professor Olesen. He is not uh, live joining us live today. He lives uh, in Denmark and has uh, was the creator of almost uh, the Danish Headache Center, as we call it. It's, it. It is one of the centers of the world where we study, uh, you know, headache profoundly. Uh, he's a professor, of course, of neurology. He, all of them, have been past presidents of the International Headache Society, and specifically, Professor Olesen uh, has chaired the classification committee um, through the last uh, three classifications. He's also the past president of the European Brain Council of the European Federation of Neurological Societies and has uh, worked all of his life in trying to, uh, in many different ways, through advocacy, research, and clinical work, help uh, patients uh, with uh, migraine. Then uh, we are also uh, going to hear from Professor Moskowitz. Professor Moskowitz um, lives in Boston. He could not join us. Well, actually, Professor Olesen has uh, university duties today, and he could not be able to join. And Mos Professor Moskowitz is traveling today and could not join us either. And on top of it, he has a six-hour uh, jet lag in comparison to our uh, European Central Time. So Professor Moskowitz is also a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, um, where he is uh, uh, working and has been working all of his lifetime. He studied uh, at Yale and then moved to Harvard and has worked together with MIT uh, in uh, actually focusing in uh, the, cere so the cerebrovascular uh, system and in migraine too. Um, he has plenty of awards and uh, is, uh, you know, uh, professor from many different universities, invited professor, and has been yes, profoundly awarded around the world. And then we have today with us live, as you can see, Professor Lars Edvinson, uh, another also past president of the International Hague Society. He trained at Lund in uh, Sweden, uh, where he became full professor there in the university. And he's also a, an expert in cerebral uh, circulation and migraine. He has been also a major contributor together with Professor Goatsby in the development of these drugs and uh, the description of CGRP, so calcitonin gene-related peptide, which is a, a neuroinflammatory peptide linked to migraine in, in that regard too. And finally, Professor Goatsby, who is Australian, you'll notice by his accent too, um, even if he has lived around uh, the Anglo-Saxon world and is the past president, not only of the International Headache Society, but also of the American Headache Society, he actually divides his, his time between UCLA, so Los Angeles, and uh, London, uh, where he works at the Wellcome Trust, nowadays Wellcome Trust uh, King's um, College, and he directs there the clinical research uh, facility and is an honor honorary consultant also for the Hospital for Six Children and um, at Great Ormond in London too. Um, so I am honored to be joined today by you. And uh, you know that we will work. Um, so the way that we are going to present this uh, session, which is, as you know, our annual conference, uh, they've all been, they've all heard, you know, from me, but also before being invited, what, what we are as an institution, I won't present th that to them. But the idea here is to, first of all, just uh, if you want to say a couple of words to start, and then um, the flow of, of, the, of this conference will go first. Uh, we'll present um, Professor Moskowitz's video. Then uh, we can talk or not a little about it. Then uh, Professor Edvinson's video, and we can also comment um, on the findings that you, you present, Lars. Then we will go to Professor Olesen's video. And then finally, Professor Goatsby will do a wrap up trying to um, convey the importance of, of what has been actually achieved with all of your different uh, research and how also they have collaborated between themselves to be able to, to uh, arrive and reach to this point. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop now speaking and I'll allow you both. Do you wanna say something first, uh, Peter, and then Lars? Well, thank you for uh, invite, inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor for us to be here. What The only thing that you didn't say in the introduction is the how uh, widely and well recognized the unit is there in Barcelona that you've established both in terms of basic research and clinical research. Uh, it, it certainly as outstanding as, uh, as anything that I know in the world. So it's, a, it's actually an honor for us, for, certainly for me, um, to be here and be able to share these thoughts uh, with, your, with your colleagues. So let, let me congratulate you on what you've managed to achieve in the last uh, period. Thank you.
Thank you, Peter. Hi, yeah. Lars. Hi, Thank Patricia. You Thank you. It's a pleasure. Of course, I would have liked to be in Barcelona, but uh, both Peter and myself, we have just come back from the European conference in Vienna. So this is very convenient to be online with you. So, yeah, this uh, is one of the, of the good things that the pandemic brought which is this digital way of being able to connect. And I, I thank you both for taking the time on, on spending this hour with us. Sure, so, people expect us to be to be at work these days in the old day. <laughs> Just a year ago, they wouldn't, mightn't have asked so many questions. True, true. We'll make an effort to bring you though here in the future. Um, so why don't we start with um, Michael Moskowitz's uh, video. Can you put the first video, please? Let's see if uh, technology works. Tans, Ditan, Capans, monoclonal antibodies, and onobotulinum toxin. Together, the most widely used drugs for the treatment of migraine. And we introduced this in the form of a hypothesis published in 1979 in The Lancet, entitled Neurotransmitters in the Fifth Cranial Nerve, Is There a Relation to the Headache Phase of Migraine? And in it, we had several quotations, two of which I want to point out. One, evidence that peptides and other transmitters participate in the pathophysiology of migraineous headache might suggest new strategies for the prophylaxis and treatment. The second is that the trigeminal nerve, as well as the blood vessel, may be an important locus for the action of serotonin antagonists that should be serotonin agonists in the therapy of migraine headaches. So this was a complete turnaround from the literature. Actually, for three decades, there were maybe one or two publications on the trigeminal nerve and migraine, and those were from the neurosurgical literature, failures of uh, obliteration of the trigeminal nerve to cure migraine headaches. And there are many explanations for why that's the case, but I don't want to get into it now. What I want to talk about is the importance of the trigeminal vascular system in the literature. This is a term that we introduced in 1983, and since then there have been over 50,000 citations and the number is increasing. In addition to conceiving and conceptualizing the trigeminal vascular system, we also discovered the sensory innervation to the circle of Willis. As you know, this innervation, this blood vessel, circle of Willis, actually a network of blood vessels that richly supply the brain, um, resides within the pia mater. And we now know from our experiments that the sensory innervation comes from primarily the first division of the trigeminal nerve. We also identified the first vasoactive peptide that was within the trigeminal vascular system, and that is in 1983. We chose substance P, a 11 amino acid containing peptide, as our first candidate, the reason being that it was the only candidate known at that time. But we put it to good use. We actually showed that we could release vasoactive peptides from sensory fibers in the meninges by depolarizing stimuli, by discharging the nerve. And we were quite interested then on what is the impact of releasing vasoactive peptides from trigeminal fibers into the meninges. And based on this interest, we in fact discovered how ergots, ergot alkaloids, and tryptans work. And to do this, we set up an animal model in which we could selectively stimulate trigeminal nerve fibers. And we looked at the consequences by light and electron microscopy in the dura mater. And what you see here is as a consequence of stimulation, this picture of a mast cell shows significant degranulation within the mast cell. And also, this is an image of a blood vessel showing leakage of plasma proteins 
into the wall of the blood vessel as compared to the control. And we were quite interested. We first thought maybe this was due to current leakage, but it's not. These changes were due to peptide release because if we depleted the peptides weeks before from these nerve fibers and then repeated the experiment, we saw none of these changes. We only saw the controls. We also could take the peptide that we knew was present in the trigeminal nerve fibers and administer it, and we could reproduce these very same changes. So this was very suggestive that the observations on cells and tissues were due to neuropeptide release. Now, the interesting result that we got was that when we pretreated the animals, normal animals, with uh, ergot alkaloids or tryptans, we can in fact block the effects of electrical stimulation. This was very curious. It wouldn't be expected from a vasoconstrictor. Then we administered the peptide to reproduce these changes and found that the ergot alkaloids and the tryptans were, were unable to block the effects of the peptide themselves. So that suggested that tryptans and the ergots were blocking neuropeptide release from nerve fibers that run close to and innervate uh, vascular smooth muscle. Another proof that we had that these receptors, in fact, were present on prejunctional nerve fibers was that we measured transcripts, gene transcripts, in the trigeminal ganglia for these 5-HT receptors. Another proof that we had that these receptors on nerve fibers were inhibiting release was by measuring the peptide CGRP in the blood, draining the meninges. So without stimulation, uh, with stimulation rather, and the stimulation bar is shown here up to three minutes, when we collected the blood, we saw a very large increase, which was significantly attenuated when the animal was given ergot alkaloids or, or sumatriptan. So putting this all together, it's very clear that drugs that were useful to treat acute migraine were blocking neuropeptide release, emphasizing the importance of the neuropeptides themselves as mediators in, in this acute attack. Now, we also postulated that if there were serotonin receptors on nerve fibers, might the situation arise where in fact, the receptors were not also present on vascular smooth muscle because the tryptans and ergots, of course, uh, cause constriction by binding to vascular smooth muscle. So we looked for the possibility of a receptor on the nerve fiber that was not expressed on vascular smooth muscle. And our work and our work by others showed that indeed there was a 5-HT1F receptor that could block peptide release, but not have any effect on vascular smooth muscle, which of course is very important for patients who have cardiovascular and cerebrovascular liabilities. And there's a drug that's just been released that passed phase three, phase three trials called lasmitidan, the first in class of the DITAN, that can do just that. And so it's very important for the selective population of patients and the drug is really quite effective. The last subject I want to talk about is identifying an upstream trigger that discharges the trigeminovascular system. So we had done neuroanatomy, we've done neurochemistry, and we realized that the blood vessels of the meninges, as shown here, are surrounded by these nerve fibers, which have a complicated receptor population that then projects into the nucleus caudalis and then into the brain. And we wanted to know what, what could be triggering the headache in a migraine attack. And we thought about this quite a long time and realized that the only upstream event that we know that occurs in anticipation of the headache is in a population of patients who have migraine with aura. And we wondered whether, in fact, the aura participated in discharging trigeminal fibers. And so we set up an animal model and right about at that same time, 
we identified a patient who could trigger his migraine attacks. And we were able to study him by functional imaging. And we, we reported it in the National Academy of Sciences. And the data is very clear because here showing the recording sites along striate cortex, primary visual cortex, we could see that the fMRI pattern becomes perturbed or changes significantly here, 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 and here. And this corresponded to the changes in the visual field that this patient was, was experiencing. And we could also measure the velocity of these changes because we knew the distances from the recording sites. And it was exactly the same as an event called cortical spreading depression, a slowly propagating discharge of neurons and glia that occurs within the cortex with a characteristic rate of two to three millimeters per minute, which corresponded exactly to the propagation velocity of the fMRI change in this patient who was having a visual aura. Well, we were very excited by this, and we wanted to follow up our studies in animal models now that we knew that the fMRI data gave us very high resolution uh, imaging to give us the velocity and pattern of blood flow changes, which we knew to be characteristic of cortical spreading depression. And one of the first things that we did, and now three other laboratories have done, is to show that cortical spreading depression is indeed noxious and it activates the trigeminovascular system. And that's why patients who have right visual field disturbance or aura, who also, of course, have then left occipital aura, develop headache over the left hemisphere because the changes that are occurring as a consequence of cortical spreading depression include the release of all kinds of transmitter molecules, um, nitric oxide, prostaglandins, um, and uh, even other pro-inflammatory molecules that are released into the occipital cortex and then make their way to activate the meninges on that side, which is innervated by ipsilateral trigeminal fibers. So this was a very important outcome, as was the demonstration that all of the drugs used for migraine prevention that penetrate into the bloods, into the brain, so like anticonvulsants, um, like uh, beta blockers, like uh, uh, methasergide, serotonin, mixed agonist, antagonist, all of them, when given chronically, have the ability to raise the threshold to evoke cortical spreading depression in our animal model. And now based on a lot of work from a number of investigators, it seems clear that an important target to raise the threshold for cortical spreading depression is removal of glutamate and removal of potassium from the extracellular space. The work that we've done recently is to show that cortical spreading depression or the human equivalent of uh, the migraine aura um, is a pro-inflammatory signal, as I just suggested. Um, and important changes occur, not only within brain, but also within the meninges. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to share with you just some of the discoveries made in our laboratory that contributed to the Brain Prize. And I wish you a very successful remainder of your meeting. Thank you so very much. Well, it, it, I thank Michael Moskowitz, even if he can't hear me. What, he was, what his lab mainly did and himself was to, to understand why the head hurts for you. You know, I'm translating what he's um, trying to, to share with you. First thing, because it's not so evident, the brain doesn't have sensory nerve uh, endings. So we had to understand why people complain about um, pain in the head. And then the other main thing was aura. Laura, eh? so how suddenly you, without any notice, you stop seeing well, and then how does that correlate with pain, and why 
unilaterally, so hemicranially, you have um, intense pain that actually, uh, you know, is very baffling for patients because they wonder why only one part of the head um, hurts and not, and not both. So that's mainly what um, Michael Moskowitz was sharing with you. So it's inflammatory uh, activation of the trigeminovascular system and aura, his very important findings. We could perhaps, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe why don't you put Lars Edvinson's video now? Ponete el video el numero dos, and then we will make a, we will be joined by by Professor Scottsby and Edvinson to comment on these first two videos. I think it's quicker. Technically, it's a challenge. Es un reto. Lo que les intentamos hacer. Vale. Dear friends and colleagues, thank you for the kind invitation to address you. It is a great honor to have received this year's Brain Prize for my work. <laughs> Starting 35 years ago and seeing the fruition with new medications, but it's equally interesting that we are not done. We have a lots of new projects ongoing. Now I will describe new frontiers in understanding and treating migraine. The story began in the midst of 1970s. Behind me, you see the first peptide we discovered that was VIP just here. And uh, that was followed by substance P, neuropeptide Y. Almost every year during this period, we found a new peptide in the perivascular nerves. Here is a summary of the findings, uh, like three different signal substances in the sympathetic nerves, a lot in the parasympathetics, and in the middle you can see the sensory fibers to uh, the uh, intracranial vessels coming from, in principle, the trigeminal ganglion. And you see, of course, substance P, pack up uh, nociceptin and CGRP. 1983, CGRP was discovered. Immediately, we started to produce a peptide using a peptide synthesizer. We got the peptide, we could verify its potent vasodilator effects. We also used the peptide to create antibodies so we could do immunohistochemistry, as you can see on this illustration. The nerves were there in 1985, they, were, they are there also today. So that's a great reward for a scientist. We also used the antibodies to create a method to measure the peptide in the circulation, radioimmunoassay. At that time, I also proposed that CGRP is in, important for regulation of the cerebral circulation, and most importantly, it's involved in migraine. Together with Peter Goldsby, we made the method the RIA method available for use in patients. And this is a first study where we verified in patients with trigeminal neuralgia that they can release into the jugular venous blood substance P and CGRP. This was not a big shock to the society. But when we came with this finding, namely that in migraine only CGRP was released, not substance P, not NPY or VIP. It was less, less interesting because everyone was looking at substance P at that time. When we came to a few years later, repeated this study uh, in patients, we had got uh, uh, sumatriptan as a tool to treat the patients when they came to the clinic. As you can see here, pain disappeared and CGRP normalized. So that was a, a very rewarding to repeat the study. Again, substance P was not altered. As you can see on the other part of this illustration, subsequent work with Peter showed that uh, sumatriptan or other triptans, they could 
they were not only vasoconstrictors, but they could inhibit the release of CGRP. In this case, we have illustrated it with the presynaptic receptor. When we have a look on the trigeminal ganglion with immunohistochemistry, we could see, as you see the red dots here, there were small cells that contain CGRP and they can release CGRP. And there are also in the upper part fibers that contain CGRP, that's the C fibers. The large green neuron in the middle, that is uh, neurons that contain CGRP receptors. And around there are something called satellite glial cells. And we also find receptors for CGRP in these. A big revolution in the understanding came when uh, the CGRP receptor was cloned and identified in detail. Here you can see that it contains two elements. One is CLR, calcitonin receptor-like receptor, and RAMP1. Both these elements are necessary for a functional receptor. The uh, Drugs that have been developed, they are listed, um, as you can see, the first two, Olsegepant and Telkegepant, the group is called GPANTS, and they can block this uh, gap between RAMP1 and CLR, and thereby CGRP doesn't have effect. There are other GPANTS coming into the market uh, as we speak. We were very rewarded when we tested the GPANTS in patients uh, during the time 2000 to 2009. They were very good. All trials were positive. They caused pain-free at uh, two hours and also a prolonged effect was seen. The program was halted, but now it is running. Then we have uh, the uh, monoclonal antibodies. They started to work on these monoclonal antibodies in uh, the midst of the 2000s. So like 2005, I first caught a glimpse of them and then we did a couple of studies, 2007. They are large molecules, 1,500 times larger than the little one, as you can see on this illustration, which is the size of a G-pant. Of course, the, uh, these large monoclonals must be injected while the GPANs can be taken orally. The antibodies, they are in principle working two ways. One is binding to the receptor, as you can see in this illustration. But that is for one of them, uh, the erinubab. The other three antibodies, they work by binding to CGRP forming a complex that does not uh, get, bind, uh, get to the binding sites also. The antibodies that uh, we have, this is just uh, illustrating this, uh, that uh, they are uh, some, the uh, receptor antibody that is totally human, the other ones are humanized. Uh, the, um, difference between the different um, monoclonal antibodies towards CGRP is due to the different binding sites on the CGRP molecule to the right here on this slide. How are they working? I just pulled out this one. The uh, upper brown part shows patients, each, each uh, little bar is a patient, and to the right you can see almost 30 uh, migraine, monthly migraine days, so very serious issues. And then the blue ones going down, that is the effect of the drug. So if I summarize, some patients have a fantastic effect, migraine totally disappears. Half of the patients, they have effects and they are often helped and happy with that. And as you can see, some of these bars, there are no blue bar with them. So there is a fraction of patients who do not respond. So how issues we can discuss further. Where are the antibodies working? 
and uh, measurements uh, of uh, different drugs, like you see, sumatriptan and the G pants, two or three percent can pass the blood brain barrier. When it comes to the antibodies, in essence, they don't pass the barrier at all. And uh, for two of them, it has been analyzed in the CNS and like less than 0.01% uh, can pass, so it's extremely little. Another issue has been discussed at length. Can the barrier open during a migraine attack? And that is, no, it doesn't. We did some studies and uh, as you can see, uh, the brain, we injected a, a tracer and uh, as you can see in the rat turned almost blue. The brain is still pale. There is no blue dye on it. Uh, and below is actually the trigeminal ganglia and I pulled it out and you can see it's blue. That means that this tracer, Evans blue, it passes the barrier freely. But that is an old method. So therefore we set up the so-called uh, permeability surface product, which is a quantitative mesh method. And you can see that the trigeminal ganglion has free access. The, this shows that it's almost as freely as to the heart or other parts of the body, while all the small other regions noted, that's in essence no passage at all, and that's different brain regions. So what we can see here is in the trigeminal ganglion, that is, shall we say, one possible site. And uh, we have the uh, red here, that is CGRP expression and the red C fibers. So they can communicate with satellite glial cells, but also with the larger neurons. And to the right, there is a blood vessel. So of course, they can also have effects there. This is just illustrating here uh, again, this communication. But how do they communicate uh, with each other or do they not? Well, we have done a, a very interesting observation that from these neurons, there are of course fibers, C fibers and A delta fibers. And interestingly, this uh, red, line you can see that is marking the A delta fibers with the uh, ramp antibodies. And what we can see in, in uh, these A delta fibers, that is something called nodes of Ranvier. That's where it's not surrounded by the myelin. And in the midst of that, there is an opening and that is uh, a possibility, which seems to be a fabulous new discovery. And you can see on this picture that there is a, the red uh, down here on this uh, thing here. You can see these are the C fibers and this is uh, boutons on the C fibers. And above that is the A delta fibers with the opening here for the nodes of Ranvier. We have made a sketch here for, easier for you to understand that in these nodes, the um, C fibers, the CGRP can be released, get to the CGRP receptors here on the A delta fibers. Cyclic AMP is formed, PKA comes here, and then this can then modify the sodium and potassium channels and thereby induce what we hypothesize its sensitization process. The remaining little story we have and currently is working on is this picture, which uh, you know very well. Below is the age of the patients, the upper one that is women and the lower one is males. Why this disproportionality between the sexes? Well, of course, it's been discussed hormones and can, for example, a hormone like estrogen modify the trigeminal pain pathway. Well, our findings now is uh, for the estrogen ER alpha, we can see them here. You can see this is uh, 
year alpha. And uh, you can see that it goes over here to the to the uh, where you see the this uh, nuclear expression of year alpha. That is very important finding, I think. But for the other um, estrogen receptor, the ER beta, it is, uh, uh, shall we say, cytoplasmic. So in different ways, these two uh, receptors can modify the expression uh, and function of uh, CGRP in the trigeminal system. So when the levels of estrogen in the blood of the females change during their active years, that can be modification of this uh, pain pathway. So there's lots more for us to work on. And uh, in uh, the caveat, of course, these uh, new antibodies and uh, the small molecules, GPANs, they may act. I think this uh, nodes of Ranvier is a key region. With knowing and understanding this, we can perhaps develop even better medications for men and women. Thank you very much for your attention. Peter, Lars, sorry, but we'll go to the third video of uh, Yes Olesen and then we'll, we'll wrap you, we'll, we'll talk about it because we are a bit uh, tight in time. Okay, okay. Third video. And yeah. then we'll, we'll chat, don't worry. I'm very pleased that I can give this uh, virtual presentation, but only very sorry that I could not be present at your meeting in Barcelona. I've had contact with uh, uh, excellent people from this uh, center for so many years. And most recently, of course, with uh, Patricia Zorosic, who is uh, now a very highly ranked international figure in the headache world. Um, <clears throat> my uh, talk today is to talk about how to study human beings and how to translate the results into uh, animal models in order to extract the more basic mechanisms of findings made in uh, human beings. I uh, developed a human model of migraine in uh, uh, around 1990. Uh, together with uh, Helix Liver Klingberg Iverson. And um, we first studied uh, nitroglycerin, and uh, here it's uh, shown the curve of headache induced by nitroglycerin with an immediate headache, followed later by a delayed headache that was exactly like the person's normal migraine attacks. Today, we use this model very often together with. Uh, uh, advanced MR studies, and all this work is today led by Professor Sukashina, whom I'm sure you all, all know very well. So uh, at the outset, using this model, we thought about, you know, which model should be used, which substances should we use first? And it was obvious that uh, at that the time histamine and nitroglycerin had already been used in human Caucasian studies, but not in a way that allowed to conclude whether they actually induce migraine or not. And I just showed you that we, we uh, did nitroglycerin, but we also, before that, even did uh, histamine. There were other drugs uh, waiting to be studied, calcitonin gene-related peptide, uh, which was present in prevascular trigeminal nerve fibers and a very strong vasodilate later. These were characteristics that we thought were important uh, for our selection of uh, studies in human beings. But there were other signaling peptides and downstream mechanisms from peptides in terms of second messengers and ion channels. The, the big scoop was, of course, that we studied uh, CGRP 
and we showed uh, that it induces headache in normal individuals and in migraine patients. After some time, patients get a migraine-like attack in 60% of the cases, and the patients told us that this is exactly like their normal migraine attacks. Uh, together with uh, the uh, interesting and uh, really breaking results of uh, Lars Edmundsen and Peter Kursby, Mike Moskowitz, these findings in human beings were crucial for the development of CGRP antagonistic drugs because at the time people thought that migraine was most likely induced in the, in the brain inside the blood-brain barrier, but CGRP did not penetrate the blood-brain barrier and nevertheless could induce a migraine attack. So um, that was maybe a reason that I was the lead also on the first proof of concept study that you all know uh, with the Beringer Ingelheim compound called uh, PIPN 4096, now called Alcitipant. And in increasing doses, it had an increasing response um, given intravenously uh, to patients during spontaneous migraine attacks. Highly significant, and that really broke the ice completely and uh, stimulated the further development also of the monoclonal antibodies against CGRP or its receptor. Uh, and you all know about these antibodies, the effect and that they are now uh, gradually taking more and more of the migraine market because they are effective and have few side effects. And, but now I want to move on to the use of animal models. And uh, this is a model developed by uh, Professor Amina Pradhan from the US uh, in uh, collaboration with uh, uh, other people. Uh, and uh, the ingenious thing that they did was to give the mouse repeated injection of a provoking agent. They started out with nitroglycerin and in a very large dose because mice don't probably have migraine and they're not easy to, to challenge to develop anything like migraine. But when they get these repeated doses every other day, <clears throat> five injections total, then they do become hypersensitive, tactile uh, sensitivity. And the tactile hypersensitivity developed in this way responds to sumatriptan and alcetipan. And therefore, it's concluded that this mouse model uh, is probably quite valid for the study of migraine. Although we must still remember that it is not the same as human migraine. Nevertheless, we can extract a lot of information from this model. So one of the first things we did was to study whether sumatriptan, one of the triptans, and alcetipan, one of the tripans, would have an additive effect in this model. So each of the substances we knew worked, would they work better given together? And here you must remember this is the control situation. This is after the animal sensitized the nitroglycerin. Uh, remember that down means more sensitivity, means more migraine like. And then we have sumatriptan, we have alcetipan, both of them work because uh, the nitroglycerin doesn't have the same effect as here. Here we have a combination of the two and a combination with an even higher dose. And you see there is no difference between the combination and each individual substance. Much to our surprise, but we suggest on the basis of its mouse models that these two drugs will not have additive effect in migraine. It, it will still have to be tested in double-blind human trials. The next question was, do these uh, 
CJP antagonists really work inside or outside of the brain. And uh, it seems likely at the outset that they work outside because they are large molecules and quite water soluble and uh, not easy, cannot penetrate very easily the blood brain barrier. So um, here we, on this side, we use ulcidipant. And what you should note here is that the normal, just a sensitization of nitroglycerin, but when the patient then gets uh, of and plus nitroglycerin, it still sensitizes so much. So there's absolutely no effect of all when it's given into the ventricular system, into the brain. But if it's given into the uh, abdomen, then it's very effective and virtually com completely prevents the sensitization by nitroglycerin. And here we have exactly the same thing, giving an antibody uh, blocking, the, uh, binding the, C, uh, the CTFP molecule that when you do a combination of antibody and CTRP, it's exactly the same as if you give only CTRP. But if you give the antibody systemically, then you cannot sensitize the animal with nitroglycerin. So the conclusion is that nitroglycerin, uh, that uh, CTRP uh, antagonists, that's depends, and antibodies, both of them work outside of the barrier. Now to <coughs> the next uh, provocation, which was done by Mr. Dashina's group, and uh, they used lift chromacalin, which opens up uh, um, the uh, ATP-sensitive potassium channels. And in this study, an enormous amount of headache is generated by lift chromacalin in migraine patients. And actually, every single patient in the study developed a migraine-like attack. So the KATP channel it's a very interesting channel in relation to migraine. So 100% got Mm, well, maybe we can stop there the videos. I'm not sure if, no sé si los videos, el último tenía algún problema, pero yo creo que ya está, ¿no? Vale, pues, um, maybe can we get, que no, nos podéis conectar otra vez con los dos speakers, por favor. Well, so, um, hi there again, Peter, hi, Lars, hi. you're with us. Hi, yes. hi. So I think that um, you have to think that this is an audience that has um, not a lot of information on, on what migraine is and, and so on. So um, can we, Lars, do you want to say something f before Peter ends up trying to uh, kind of make a sense of all of this story? So I think inspirational you know, messages probably for other researchers and, and the findings you know, that you all have done. Maybe the first one could be that it takes maybe almost 30 years sometimes. You, you have shown all of you papers that were published in the 1980s, 1979 uh, to the 1990s, and then all of the development that you were explaining, Lars, in regards to the first trials on drugs that were blocking um, all of these peptides that we are mentioning. So how is, Lars, what, was, what is your personal experience on on you know any tips or tricks or, or something that you might want to share with the audience in regards to how how has this journey been for you you know well uh, as a young researcher uh, I had the curiosity and uh, and uh, the main the most important is actually if you feel you have done good experiments and you trust your data. Uh, then 
keep on and persist. And then comes people like uh, Peter around and then that gets extra stimulated and then we can take it to uh, another level. Uh, so, I mean, I think we were very ready at, uh, shall we say, once the substance P field collapsed, uh, like 2000. But uh, the medicine could have been there uh, 10 years ago if uh, the uh, GPANs had not uh, failed by uh, giving some uh, liver uh, toxicity. Uh, and uh, persistence is a key word I would like to uh, have as a stamp on my forehead. <laughs> persistence, yes, indeed. Yes. You have to persist yes. and be sure that what you're doing is the right thing, as you're saying. So methodology also, no? Yes, you, and, must, um, you must know your method and you must uh, believe that you're doing the best uh, you can and then yeah. keep on. That's... Uh, Keep on going. Uh, yes, <laughs> another, yes. Another tip and trick for everyone. <laughs> no, and, and I think that also observation, clinical observation, you mentioned uh, about women, you know, ha having, you know, at least in their uh, more fertile years, the, the incidence of migraine is higher in women. And now you're still researching on trying to explain that, trying to explain what aura is. So understanding and listening to patients going, you know, from um, the bedside, and then trying to translate this with, as you've shown all of you, different experiments, um, you know, animal model research, human model research, provoking headache even uh, to patients and understanding what is the flow there. So I think there's many, many things that we can learn from all of the collective experience of, of the four of you. Um, so thank you so much for, for persisting. And I think our patients around the globe, uh, thank all of you, you know, for that effort um, along your life. Yeah, thank you. Um, Peter, um, how about you? Uh, you? I know you've been quiet for now, but yeah. uh, so <laughs> can you maybe share with us um, through your, I know you have a presentation ready, a short presentation, but also your thoughts, what have you seen and, and what can you also share with the audience that we have here today? I'd agree with what Lars has said, certainly persistence and, and, and being careful about what, one, what one's doing. That's true in the laboratory, but it's equally true in clinical in clinical research. Clinical research is not some sort of uh, half baked pastime that you do that that you can do off the cuff. Careful, I think part of the success of what we were able to do is we had we had persistence. We had great collaboration. You know, last night still talk <laughs> years later. There you go, um, and we had. That means you can trust people when you're doing things, and, and the methods, um, the, the, the me being very, very careful whether it's what you're doing in the laboratory or what you're doing clinically, it really matters. Getting a really careful and detailed history so that when you're starting to study patients, you you can be absolutely confident that if someone studied the same patient, they get the same result because you're being really careful about what you're what you're doing. I think it applies across all of science, and it sometimes clinical research is seen as a poor second cousin of this, but I think that's that, that's really that's actually a really bad mistake and leads to uh, translational research being um, being much more difficult to do if it's not clear. Indeed, this is, uh, you know, we are based in a hospital, you know, where I work, and um, we do a lot of translational and clinical research, you're absolutely right, but it seems, as, as you say, that to be a true scientist, sometimes you need to go and do preclinical animal model-based research, but you're absolutely right that um, doing just clinical research is sometimes good enough. And uh, we, should, we should all be proud of, of uh, all of the efforts that we you know, do in, and also uh, doing it as you all have done. I mean, yourself, um, you still uh, do clinical work. So yeah. it is also a challenge to combine both facets uh, you know, in life to be a researcher, but also a clinician. But probably that's um, the best uh, way of trying to understand what are the real meaningful clinical problems for our you know, patients and then going and answering these uh, specific questions with research. When we, we look at these new methods that are coming along, uh, yeah. natural language processing approaches also, yeah. to, uh, to, 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 to handling the histories that we take, if we provide, um, as clinician researchers, if we provide junk, 
um, no matter how clever the algorithm is, then we're going to get junk. But if we, if we provide high quality work, high quality uh, input, then we, that we will discover things that we hadn't known, that, that it's on us to do that properly. Absolutely, yeah. New new technologies, um, digitalization, data, and understanding that. Do you want to share with us then um, your presentation, and we'll wrap uh, we'll wrap I a will. bit the story up. Thank you, Peter. I was thanks, Trisha. I was asked to talk about burden of migraine a little bit just to give people a broad view about that and to um and, and then say thinking about the development of the medicines a little bit which you've which you've heard of course migraine as a headache person migraine is the first thing listed in the international classification of headache disorders which uh, professor olison uh chaired that committee for three versions and but it's not the only thing in the headache world if you look at something, if you look at this list, for example, cluster headache, the, the proportion of cluster headache patients in the population, particularly in northern climes, is about the same as the proportion of multiple sclerosis. So, you know, our um, one of our rarer problems is the entirety of many people's problems uh, altogether. There's, a, there's something for everyone in headache, I'd like to say that. As a neurologist, you know, one does a little bit of organisation and stamp collecting, you might say, and, and uh, headache disorders are just as good for that detailed clinical work and digging out rare problems like paroxysmal hemicrania as anything else. So uh, I encourage people who are interested in headache to see it in a very broad sense. Headache is very broad in terms of the burden in the community, and it's a global problem. Uh, as Patricia says, it doesn't matter really where you go in the globe with the exclusion perhaps of a few little white spots you can see there. Um, no, one's, no one's looked at headache in North Korea, but then people don't look at very much in North Korea. So that's a that's a more complex, uh, that's a more complex thing. This is a global problem. So when you take on global problems, the nice thing is if you do something useful, then uh, you'll get a you'll get something globally out of that. And the, from a neurologic perspective, just focusing in on that for a moment, if you look there at the global burden of neurologic diseases, is the the sort of bible of these things that come out comes out in the lance of neurology every couple of years. You see that on a global basis, migraine ranks number two. Uh, after stroke and in, in some parts of the world depends a little bit on demographics you can see it does uh, you might say a little bit better or a little bit worse of course for a disorder that you're interested in to rank number two for for burden of disease is actually not a marker I care to be proud of it's it's it's, it's clearly a problem if you look then of course at females and males and Lars emphasized this the in the um in that uh, khaki color you can see migraine uh, affecting both, you see it affecting more females. And a, a point I will make about the disorder, when you look at the age group, migraine is a disorder of taxpayers. It's a disorder of the economically active. So in any reasonable assessment of what you, of improving health broadly, it's terribly important that you, we address migraine because it's reversible. People go back to work and in the current uh, state of things, I always like to say to, uh, to uh, government people, they go back to paying taxes and that seems to get their attention. Just all the governments are broke at the moment. Broad problem. Problem uh, in Europe, healthcare re resource utilisation. Just draw your attention probably to the, uh, on the right side, episodic migraine is less than 14, day, 14 days or less per month and chronic migraine 15 or more days per month. It's very arbitrary, but um, I... I I wouldn't argue the number. These are in euros on the right. And I, I particularly put this slide up because it's got data from Spain that included GP and neurologist data. And you see that episodic migraine totally quarterly treatment costs. And this was uh, data from about 2019 that Pablo Aremia led on presenting at the European Academy of Neurology a few years ago. That's a lot of euros, 986 um, euros individual patient quarterly treatment costs. You add that up with the number of migraineurs, and certainly this is a burdensome problem. Whether you look at the world, if you look at the ratios, or you actually look um, at the cost, it's a serious problem. And this is, the again, the broad epidemiology to remind us 
that migraine um, is, is common, three females. The, the lifetime cumulative incidence is interesting because when one thinks about it, you've got 43% of females with migraine. This is uh, episodic migraine. If you had chronic migraine and probable migraine, you put it all together, it gets to about 50%. So half the mothers of the Western world, so to speak, have migraine, which means the genetic load is incredibly heavy. I want to show this slide because we've talked about the successes, and of course, as we do, and very happy for them, but it's not like everything that got tested in migraine in the last 25 years worked. In fact, many things didn't. And this is a kind of family tree of how people went about the process, starting with ergots and developing triptans, and then realizing that what needed to be done was to get away from vessels, um, A, because are they important, and B, because it's undesirable from a clinical perspective, and to get it, to look at neural mechanisms. On the left there is a little uh, box, actually. It was a box of five, um, not used, but I, certainly out of date, 1931, um, ergot uh, injections that Jim Lance gave me when he was clearing out his desk before he retired. He thought I might like the box, and so I made a little slide. It reminds you of how old uh, the ergot story is. Now, looking at the neural mechanisms, you see on the left of the dotted line are things that failed, are ideas that seemed like a good idea, but didn't work. One of them, the substance P data that uh, people have talked about, each of those blue is placebo, and uh, these are pain-free at two hours, and yellow is the active. And you see 205171, it was the Glaxo substance P antagonist. Back in the day, everyone wanted one, and, and that's complete, was completely useless. The plasma protein extravasation inhibitors, as you can see, both given orally and intravenously, completely useless. And one that people that got buried a bit and people don't uh, think about it enough, I don't think, is the TRIP-V1, the capsaicin uh, receptor, uh, tested there with 705-498. This is a, a GlaxoSmithKline um, ligand. And you can see completely useless as an acute treatment. And I, I'll contrast that to the entities that have worked the GPANS, the CGRP small molecule receptor antagonist there, um, sumatriptan just as a, a, sort of a, a baseline, you might say, working clearly. That's the from the meta-analysis that Richard Lipton and Michelle Ferrari and I, I did some years ago. And then the first of the lasmiditan oral studies uh, there against getting against placebo. They work. They clearly work. Now, what's um, an important aspect of this in terms of the dietens, and I just want to say something about it because it's it's relevant. It just shows to show you how a clinical translational result can really illustrate something about the the basic principles behind a condition. We were interested in this uh, many years ago. On the top left, three three four four eight six nine is a Lily um, experimental one F agonist that never went to clinic. And what we did was show that you could record from trigeminal neurons and you could inhibit them. With the with that uh, that one F agonist, and you couldn't block that effect with if you want anti tryptans. So there were two two four two eight nine and one five five seven two are one B and one D respectively receptor antagonists. So they would block any tryptan effect, and on their own or combined, they don't block the one F effect. And this would predict um, an effect at one F receptor. The triptans themselves, some of them have 1F effects like narrow triptan, some like rhizotriptan, don't at all. And then they don't have a vascular effect. The bottom line, Rubio Beltrans and uh, Antoinette Madsen Vandenbrink, and you see the bottom line of lasmiditan. It's just flat because in the proximal or distal human coronaries, these are data come from, in any vessel bed, Dietans don't have an effect because they don't act on blood vessels. However, on the top right there, data that uh, Marta Villa uh, produced when she was with us uh, in London, and she's now back uh, with herself there, and I hope enjoying being back in Barcelona. I'm sure she does. Showing that in a model of um, trigeminal autonomic activation, that lasmiditan would turn off uh, these neurons just as we would hope. But then the bottom right is the, the clinical data two randomized parallel group placebo control, well-powered phase three studies that showed lasmiditan um, placebo 50, 100 and 200 milligrams was effective in the acute treatment of migraine. So you can stop a migraine without constricting blood vessels. And this is, a, this is the test of that neural hypothesis, which is, which is clearly a better way forward. Now on the GPAN side, 
Uh, the first of these, as, um, as uh, La, uh, yes, Olison pointed out, was uh, Al Segipand, a study that he led, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's an up-down design. It was intravenous. That's why I've got the little dashed line. All the ones on the right are the oral G pants that have been developed. And as, as I said, as a scientist, a clinical scientist, Seeing things reproduced is a good thing. So all of those blues are all placebo. The yellows are the G pants and the mauves, zolmitriptan, elitriptan, and uh, sumatriptan. Every time a G pant has been tested, whether orally, intravenously, or uh, it's a veggie pan on the right side, intranasally, nasally, they all always work. It's a reproducible experiment, and that uh, is a that's really quite relieving from a scientist's uh, perspective. I point out that there are parallel group studies with triptans. People sometimes say they don't exist, but they clearly do. The little, what happened was Telkaji Pant and 3207 died because of toxicological problems. Uh, the 44370 was stopped because didn't, they didn't think, Burringer didn't think it was financially a useful thing. And Romagipan and Ubrogipan have gone on and are now licensed um, in the US by the FDA for the acute treatment of migraine. And Romagipan's licensed by the European Medicines agency for the acute treatment of uh, migraine and actually for the preventive treatment of migraine in Europe. So these work and they've all come through. And they were designed as acute treatments. And that's the, an important bridge because up to this point, if you'd have said to someone that you'd take an acute treatment and use it as a preventive, they'd think you were pretty much crazy because, for example, if you gave sumatriptan every day to somebody, you'd expect a proportion of people to get worse because of medication overuse. And I want to show you these these, this is a bridging slide to understand how we got to monoclonals. So what you see on the left side of the topiramate studies at the top is the European study led by Dina. At the bottom are the American studies, Silverstein and Brandes. And I draw your attention firstly to the placebo 50% response rates, 22, 23, 23. They're more or less the same. Now, if you look at Stovner's care to study against uh, placebo and uh, propranolol, again, 50% responder rate, 23%. That's about what it was when those studies, and it gives you a sense that the populations are broadly comparable. And it gives you a sense that, for example, propranolol and uh, candesartan in the Stovner study is more or less the same as propranolol and topiramate in the Dina study because propranolol is propranolol. Okay, that's reassuring. Bottom right was a really quite a disruptive study that we convinced the Merck people to do where they took telkagipant, which worked acutely, three very large studies that showed that, gave it preventatively twice a day, 140 or 20 milligrams twice a day. And this is the result. Placebo, 22%, it's right on the money, exactly what you'd want. 40 and 41%, 50% responder rates. Does it look the same? Sure, it looks the same as any of these, uh, these other medicines in, in the broadest context, meaning that it worked as a preventive but it also produced ALT elevations in two and a half percent of patients. And so that caused it to die. That's what killed the first generation uh, g pant before the chemists could overcome the problem. And before they could, the monoclonal antibody people said, well, okay, we can sort this out because monoclonal antibodies are not gonna be broken down by the liver and here's a target. And so we have the evolution of eptinizumab, arendumab, galcanizumab, fremenizumab as, um, as CGRP pathway monoclonals. Three of them target both the alpha and the beta form of CGRP. One targets the receptor, the canonical receptor, the calcitonin-like receptor, and the uh, with, with uh, combined with RAMP1. They're all indicated for migraine, used widely in the world, and uh, galcanazumab is licensed for cluster headache by the FDA. I just point out a couple of things, which is, I think, really remarkable about this development. We don't see any... Um, opportunistic infections, because this, this is immunopharmacology, not immunomodulation. So the top end, the FAB end, is doing the, is doing the business with either the CGRP or with the receptor binding, and that is to say, in the bottom end, medics, metabolic stability, the FCRN. In the middle, the interactions, the FC region uh, interacting, the FC gamma region interacting with the immune system. And that's, the, that's been mutated either by reduce, by changing amino acids, three amino acids in fremenizumab, uh, as example, and that's the top right there labeled seven. You see the flat line interaction with the immune system or by changing the sugars in that area to prevent binding of immune uh, mediators. So glycoengineering, 
Down to the detail, it's eptonizumab on the right with X-ray crystallography and light blue shows you how CGRP sits amongst the complementarity determining regions to be captured. Extraordinary to be able to view exactly what's going on when you give a monoclonal antibody uh, to a patient. As has as been said, migraine's a complex thing. It's a neurologic thing. It starts, you're seeing the spreading depression just going across the um, brain there. It's a cat brain. Andy Parsons gave me that many years ago. You can see in human imaging an evolution from not diencephalic and cortical areas at the start and the involvement of the trigeminal autonomic reflex, the increasing understanding of the importance of the premonitory symptomatology that can then run into the acute phase, or even the fact that things we've typically thought of like photophobia is only occurring in the pain phase that occur in the premonitory phase, is complex as we unpick the elements of the network. Understanding this system has given us triptans, serotonin 1B, 1D receptor agonist. It's given us GPANTS, the, the CGRP small molecule receptor antagonist. It's given us these uh, antibodies, it's actually given us neuromodulation we haven't talked about, and it's given us the diatens, the 1F receptor agonist. It's led us to look at pituitary adenylate cyclase activating peptide, to glutamatergic mechanisms, orexinergic mechanisms, delta opioid, acid sensing ion channels, NOS, and TRIP M8. There was a time when people used to think about headache disorders, migraine is just like dirt in neurology because it was common. It's common. There's nothing wrong with studying common things and get a useful effect out of it. And you could look at that that uh, picture on the right of that panel and you could look at that and you could see it was dirt or you could look at it and you could realize that that's a picture of Mars from the Mars rover because migraine, a headache disorder is just as exciting as, as exploring Mars. And I'd encourage anyone who's um, coming, thinking about a career, specifically neurology residents who are sitting there, that Patricia would be a splendid place to go looking at this because there's going to be fantastic things that happen in migraine in the uh, in the next years, I'll stop there because Thank I know you, we're Peter. short of time. Thanks. Well, very interesting. I'm sure now that everyone here in the room wants to go and explore Mars, <laughs> with, and then oh. by that, then uh, understand um, the fascination that uh, you know research is about um, amongst it. Also, migraine, as you're saying, a common, very uh, prevalent and burdensome uh, disorder. So um, I thank you for this over nice overview that you you've done to us. And um, uh, I just uh, I have to probably say thank you for being here today. And I wish you all uh, happy holidays and hope to see you again in 2023 very soon. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, gracias a todos. Espero que nos haya parecido demasiado eh, largo todo, pero creo que, que era la oportunidad de volver a, bueno, de ver, a, para mí volver, pero para vosotros, de tener un contacto, aunque fuese así de manera más digital, con eh, personas que han estado investigando, haciendo lo que vosotros hacéis todos los días y que eh, pueden contar una historia de, de éxito que ha tenido un impacto profundo en el desarrollo de los tratamientos que estamos hoy en día ofreciendo a los pacientes. Así que gracias.